Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Lakeland Hogan. I am Home Instead's gerontologist and caregiver advocate. We're so glad that you're joining us for today's caregiver chat. I am joined by Grace Whiting. I'll introduce her in just a moment. Uh, but we do these monthly chats um, each and every month. Uh, that's why we call them monthly chats. And we're excited to highlight a different caregiving topic and bring you helpful information and resources. And these chats are brought to you by Home Instead. And we invite you to visit homeinstead.com to learn more. Uh, you can also follow us on Facebook. We'll post the link to our Facebook group, but uh, we update that group uh, regularly with content and information. And we also post about these upcoming chats. So I hope that you will follow us. Uh, and again, thank you so much for joining us today. So to just kick off our topic, we'll be talking more today about caregiving during a pandemic, a year in review. And it's really hard to believe that this COVID-19 pandemic has been impacting the world for over a year now. Many family caregivers' lives were turned upside down, and many individuals found themselves in a caregiving role for the very first time. And we've all experienced challenges. We've also learned uh, resiliency, new skills, and we've learned the importance of connection. So I'm really looking forward to talking today about how the pandemic has impacted caregivers and the lessons that we've learned for the future of caregiving. And joining me is Grace Whiting. She is the president and CEO at the National Alliance for Caregiving. Grace led the launch of the Caregiving in the US 2015 report with AARP. She has contributed to several national reports on caregiving, including cancer caregiving in the US uh, with the National Cancer Institute and Cancer Support Community and then also dementia caregiving in the US with the Alzheimer's Association. She previously led the advocacy and communications work at LEAD Coalition and also worked at the Alliance for Home Health Quality and Innovation. She's spoken on, uh, on the topic of caregiving at national and international conferences and serves as a resource to major media on the topic of caregiving, including C-SPAN, The Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine and Oprah Magazine. Uh, I just have the utmost respect for Grace. She does great work in our community, um, or our national uh, community. And I just welcome you today, Grace. Thank you so much for being here. Oh my gosh, it is it is so wonderful to be able to spend my lunch hour with all of you and talking about a topic I love and uh, Lakeland and the feeling is mutual. It, it's wonderful to have an advocate like you for caregivers. So thank you for having me. Well, thank you for those kind words. And we both have our teacups. I, I too am grateful that everyone's joining us over the lunch hour. So cheers, everyone. Uh, please feel free to grab your own cup of coffee or tea uh, as we dive into today's topic. Uh, and again, uh, I talked about how the impacts of the pandemic were really challenging for everyone. People were balancing working from home for the first time. Many were homeschooling children. And then caregivers had additional challenges. Some were cut off from regular support services or respite services, and some found themselves caregiving for the very first time for an aging loved one who needed more support because we were all confined to our homes and not able really to go out and about. And so as we're a year into the pandemic, um, there's been a lot that has been studied. We've been reflecting and looking back at this past year. And so to start our conversation, I thought I would share a story of a caregiver her name is Maria, and she wrote into our live chat inbox about her caregiving situation. And I think it, it helps to paint a picture of some of the things caregivers experienced over this last 12 months. So Maria was caring for her mom uh, six months prior to the pandemic kind of shutting the world down. She needed a lot of, her mom needed a lot of support and was um, recently undergoing surgery to improve her condition physically but she was experiencing cognitive decline. So Maria was a caregiver well before the pandemic took place, but then COVID hit and she was not able to go into her work setting and her family support was cut off. Uh, she really had no resources, nowhere to turn. So she was forced to take care of her mom alone and she was witnessing the cognitive decline uh, and the functional decline of her mom uh, to the point where she, her mom no longer recognized her anymore. And Maria became depressed during this time. 
Fortunately, she was able to determine that something was wrong with her mental health. She was having suicidal ideation, uh, ideation and uh, repeated panic attacks, but she was able to seek out some psychiatric and spiritual counseling during this time to really help her cope. And after some time, she was able to eventually bring in some help, uh, a paid professional to help support her in the home, but that care was getting to be costly and and her mom is now requiring two professional caregivers per visit. And so really, uh, Maria has just been very stressed and challenged during this past year. And I know Maria is not alone. And Grace, I'm sure you've heard a lot of stories similar to Maria's. But uh, I know, you know, the National Alliance for Caregiving has partnered with organizations to look into the challenges like Maria has had. Um, and, and you've learned a lot. So I would love to hear from you uh, what kind of patterns you've noticed and the challenges that caregivers have been experiencing during this pandemic. Well, first, let me just say, you know, thanks to Maria for sharing that and for, and for being willing to talk about that. One of the things that struck me as people have been researching this over the last year is uh, one of the caregivers in, in a study that we participated in said essentially, um, there's just no voice for us. And that feeling of who is advocating for me, who is thinking about what I might need. And that feeling I think has been pervasive and it's something that we worry about when we think about life after COVID. But there were some really um, intense findings over the last year. University of Pittsburgh, found that four out of 10 caregivers said that the pandemic had actually made their health worse and their finances worse. And about a third said their health was worse even than before the pandemic. And then it made it harder for them to access healthcare. And certainly we see that where people put off, you know, eye appointments or regular routine care because they're busy taking care of another person and because they're worried about contagion due to COVID. The other thing that came out loud and clear, not just in the Pittsburgh study, but also in some work from the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving was food insecurity. And a lot of families said that they could not afford nutritious food, that they couldn't get access to food, that they found themselves ordering a lot of takeout because they were so busy trying to do everything and manage their jobs. And then the last thing I would say is, is we worked with a group called Embracing Carers to do a global study. And what they found was very similar. And they highlighted too, that in many cases, women are the ones who are taking on all that additional activity and care work. And it's ironic in a way, because here we are, it's Women's Month. You know, we're celebrating women's history. We're recognizing the International Day of the Woman. And yet in the midst of the pandemic, women have borne more of the brunt of the financial impact, the care work impact of having to step back from work responsibilities. So it's something for us to keep top of mind when we think about what's the future for women, especially those who are caring. Wow, what interesting findings, Grace, and and some kind of surprising ones. I wouldn't have thought that you know food insecurity or access to food was a challenge for many people during this pandemic. But if you think about it, um, you know, the accessing a grocery store or feeling comfortable going there uh, might have been a challenge for some individuals. And uh, I can understand how life gets busy. You're caregiving. You're working from home, homeschooling your kids. So cooking is the last thing you want to do. Uh, so ordering that takeout can be, become uh, pretty expensive. And uh, so, wow, thank you for sharing those findings. And, and I know that um, you have also kind of mapped out these findings in, in a really neat visual that I would, I would love to share and love to have you talk more about, because I think that this helps us really understand kind of um, I'm a visual person. So from a visual perspective, <laughs> how, how this pandemic has impacted caregivers and, and I'll work on, on getting that pulled up here. Yeah. And, and I'll just share, you know, something that we've been thinking a lot about over this last year is representation. You know, if you are impacted by caregiving, if you are caring for someone, we wanted to be able to capture in a picture, this is kind of what you're experiencing so that we could communicate that to people in Congress, to other people in government who might be designing programs for caregivers, for people who are 
um, experiencing this day to day and they want to do something in their community to help. And so we started with our board of directors and then expanded out and got feedback from researchers and got feedback from people around the world who run caregiving programs. And what we have now is, is the beginning of what we hope can be a, a central hub for resources that families are looking for when they're in crisis. So I, you know, it's something that if you're listening or watching and you think, gosh, I would love to give feedback on this or to share something I've been working on, we wanna hear from you. We want this to be something that's really driven by the people who are experiencing caregiving. That's wonderful. I think collecting that that feedback can be so vital. And, and I'm working on getting that pulled up. So hopefully we'll have it here in, in just a moment. Um, but we'll also share that the link uh, to that that site that you you mentioned, Grace, and uh, and hopefully we'll have that visual. Uh, just having a little technical difficulty with with sharing uh, capabilities, but hopefully we can pull that up soon. Um, but I know that. Um, you know, despite all of these these challenges that we're seeing, I think it can be helpful at times to focus on those silver linings. You know, we we uh, we did have a lot of challenges, and I think it's really healthy and important to acknowledge those challenges and learn from them. But it can also be helpful to to find those silver linings and to to come away from this pandemic with some lessons learned. So, uh, from your perspective, Grace, what are some of those silver linings that came out of this pandemic? The biggest is probably that people are more aware of caregiving as an issue. I think before the pandemic, there was awareness and the sense of, you know, you could see media like movies like Still Alice talking about, you know, this is the impact of living with dementia or this is the impact of living with cancer. Um, but the pandemic really made it clear that it's part of our everyday life, you know, to watch the national news and to have somebody's kid <laughs> run across the background or to be on a call uh, on a video call and to have someone say, well, I got to, you know, step away and give medicine to my mom in the same way that you might say, oh, I'm sorry, I got to answer the door or I need to, you know, <laughs> I, need, I need my dog to um, take a nap right now <laughs> while I'm on the call. So I think that normalizing of caregiving and, and has helped in terms of awareness and particularly for people who have the kind of jobs where they can work remotely a lot of those caregivers have said in some ways it's made their life a little bit easier not that they have all this extra stuff they have to do with the pandemic but just the fact that people are noticing what they're going through um, technology of course i think it's amazing before it was pulling teeth to be able to use technology for both telehealth and just communicating with friends and family. And now everyone, you know, Zoom has become a verb, which is just a, an amazing thing. And I, and, you know, even if our quote for last year is you're on mute, I think the fact that we've all figured out how to navigate it is a huge opportunity. And I also think there's that sense of volunteerism. I noticed on my neighborhood app, um, where people are talking about what can we do? There's a lot of, can we help out with each other? And one thing I loved Lakeland was when you were telling me about the, the pen pal program that Home Instead has done to kind of give people a chance to care for caregivers and care for older adults. Yeah, I know um, isolation and loneliness is another challenge that so many caregivers and, and older adults faced during the pandemic. I think there was a light shown uh, a lot of times on on older adults being isolated, but but their caregivers were isolated as well. And so, um, yes, at home and said we created a pen pal program, which we just saw a flood of of response to, and uh, people just wanting to connect. Uh, we, it was neat. There were some younger pen pals that wanted advice from the older pen pals on how to navigate the pandemic. Uh, so there was some some wisdom sharing through that, and and folks can still get involved in that. It's an ongoing. Um, um, initiative that we have and so we can put the link in the chat but yeah we did see I think an uptake in volunteerism and and also people um, becoming more um, technology accepting uh, if you will and so I think that yeah. hopefully those things will carry on uh, you know when the the light is at the end of the tunnel these vaccines are coming out and so people are 
um, it feels like we're, we're slowly coming out of this pandemic, but hopefully these things will continue. Uh, the technology utilization and, and the volunteerism and, uh, and, and the awareness of caregiving. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, go ahead, Grace. Oh, well, well I was just going to say, you know, one of the things I love about this idea of the pen pal program is you know, some of those low tech solutions are actually really good as well. And even telephone um, conversations. I was just talking with a friend yesterday about, you know, sometimes people get nervous on Zoom because they say, well, I can't stop looking at myself, but being able to pick up the phone and call someone and ask how they are and listen is just also an incredibly important skill and gift that you can give another person. So there's that. And I was just smiling because I was thinking my mom and I have been doing virtual shopping trips on Zoom. So we'll go through the sales items from different department stores and she'll say, this is a good deal. This is not a good deal. <laughs> so, you know, being able to spend that time with my mom, even though she's across the country has been wonderful and being able to email my grandma and my grandma will be comfortable emailing back. I mean, I think just having those moments where you can be present technology has really helped with that. Certainly. I think we all have could share a story, story upon story of how technology has helped us to connect um, throughout this past year. Uh, but, and we know that, you know, the, the, the light is kind of at the end of the tunnel. We see it, we're approaching it, but people are still navigating uh, this pandemic, still navigating COVID-19 and, um, you know, juggling kind of the risk of, of starting to enter out into the community and uh, those sorts of things. So uh, I would love, to hear from you, Grace, do you have any tips or resources for families as they're continuing to navigate uh, COVID-19? I think the biggest thing that caregivers should be thinking about is how do I take a break? How do I reset? And there are small ways you can do that, you know, finding 15 minutes a day to go for a walk and take a deep breath and just have some space to yourself. There's also, I think, more formal programs, typically called respite care. So for example, the area agencies on aging or your local senior centers, they may offer special programs for caregivers to help you find that moment of break, to connect with other people, to get connected into support groups. So that's a great place to start. There's also a coalition called the Arch National Respite Coalition. And it's a group of all these respite providers around the country. And they too have a number of programs and they've been really creative about trying to modify these programs for a COVID world. Um, and then groups like Hilarity for Charity or HFC have respite programs as well. So really thinking about how can I take a break? How can I um, get a chance to get out there and even you know, meditate or, you know, watch a movie at home that I want to watch, you know, and, and, and take that time for yourself, because that is so important to really weathering a crisis like this. Yeah, those are some great tips. I think that that time away from caregiving really does uh, give an individual time to recharge. And some people might think, well, I, it's still not safe for me to leave my home or to leave my loved one. And it doesn't have to be you know, a half day away to, to refresh and recharge. It can be those little, you know, 15 minute walks that you suggested or the five minutes with your meditation app or um, even just a nap in the afternoon just to refresh yourself. Uh, and so hopefully people are starting to seek out some resources too as they feel comfortable as the vaccines roll out. And I love that you mentioned respite programs and uh, the HFC grant program. And, and at home instead, we provide in-home services that can, can also give family caregivers a break, give them some respite. Um, and I think it is important to, you know, find, find the support that you need. Um, and, and Grace, I'm able now to pull up that document. So I have the screen sharing capabilities to do so. So I did want to just uh, highlight this document. There's two images. The first is the, the kind of challenges. And then the next is uh, images of how to help caregivers navigate through uh, a crisis. So I hope you can see this now on the screen. Grace, can you see it on your end? I can. Yes. And you know, what was interesting about this is we, as we were doing it, 
we had all different, you know, we had dots, we had, <laughs> we had boxes, but when we brought it to the caregivers we were working with, they were saying, you know, it's, it's really sort of like being in the middle of a storm. And we started to really synthesize what people had said, you know, how do we kind of break this down into smaller buckets so that someone who's not in the situation can understand. And when we first did the clouds, I thought, oh my gosh, that's a lot of clouds, <laughs> you know? But when we brought it to our steering committee, which included folks who are caregivers, who've lived it, who work with caregivers every day, they said, no, I, I think this, this makes sense because this is how I feel. I feel like I'm um, sort of under this cloud and I'm feeling pressure in the sense of, I'm trying to figure out how to be a caregiver. I'm trying to grapple with the fact that people are excluding me as that partner in care. And I'm really feeling extra pressure on home, on myself and on my family. And so that's really what we wanted to illustrate here is particularly during COVID, these were the pressure points that we saw that many families were facing. Yeah, and I, I, I do like this graphic and how you've broken it down. And um, I think that it's probably very small for people joining to, to read, but this first um, gal on the left, she's saying, how will I know how to care for my grandmother when she leaves the hospital? So yeah, people are feeling unprepared for the care that they're providing. And uh, the, the middle individual in the yellow jacket is saying, we've already uh, already signed the privacy forms. Why am I being excluded? And I know during the pandemic, if a loved one was in a hospital or a facility, family members couldn't go in, even if they were the primary caregiver. And so that was very stressful for a lot of people. Um, and then the, the gentleman on the right, he says, I feel like I'm neglecting my kids and their schoolwork. So yeah, that that balancing of all the caregiving responsibilities that really can weigh an individual down in a, in a normal, uh, you know, everyday world, let alone in a pandemic. Um, and so, but what I love is that on this next, um, this next graphic, you've, you've outlined some interventions uh, for caregivers during crisis. So Grace, would you mind sharing a little more about this, this graphic? Yeah, I think here, what we were trying to think about are what are some with some big ideas that could really help caregivers when they are in crisis, whether it's COVID-19 or a future crisis. And so there's the general preparing people for care, you know, helping people understand what their needs are, giving them the training and education they need to understand the disease, how to care for someone, that advanced care planning, and really promoting credible information. That's something that's been challenging during the pandemic because information has changed as we learn more about COVID-19, but there's also just a lot of information constantly out there and not all of it is credible. And then I think this piece about being included on the care team, that's something a lot of families talk to us about. They said, you know, I'm at the hospital and they won't let me in to talk with the person that I'm taking care of, or I can't get information about what's going on with my loved one who's in an assisted living facility. And so really defining and recognizing that role, thinking about um, access and making sure that the care that's being provided is culturally literate and competent. And then finally, I think really connecting people to support. So that could be anything from finances to how to keep your house safe to your mental health, your social engagement and your community. Um, but this is really where I think if you're looking at this and you're thinking, wow, I have a program that fits here, or I know something that really helped me was this program and support, you know, we would love to hear from you about it. And that's partially what the next part of this project is doing is trying to collect those in one place so that people don't have to go to 30 different websites and, you know, <laughs> scroll through a long list of hundreds of resources. Um, but rather that we would do some of that for you so that you wouldn't have to spend so much time trying to figure out, is this good? Or is this going to be, you know, um, sort of a rabbit hole with no end in sight? Yeah. Well, and thank you for, for working on creating a place where caregivers can go for that resource and information. And so we'll make sure to share that, in, that link uh, to the, the site that kind of coincides with these images that we've been sharing um, with, with you all via the chat, uh, or if you're on Facebook, we'll put it in the comments section below. 
Um, so before we kind of open it up for Q&A, Grace, I would love to hear from your perspective, the National Alliance for Caregiving's perspective about how the pandemic will impact caregiving going forward. So as we take away all these learnings, well, how can we move forward? And uh, how are you all advocating for caregivers coming out of this pandemic? I think one of the things we're excited about, or really I should say, we're cautiously optimistic is that the new presidential administration under President Biden, um, one of the things he did front and center was he said, I'm going to have a plan for caregivers. And, you know, he cared for his son who had um, glioblastoma through the end of his son's life. And his wife, Dr. Jill Biden, has done a lot of work around caregivers of veterans. So people who are wounded warriors who are coming back and worked um, with Senator Elizabeth Dole and others on the Hidden Heroes Initiative that really focused in on what can we do to support veteran caregivers. So I think what we're seeing is more conversation about caregivers and how do we support them. Now, the tricky thing is, as we sort of come out of the pandemic, some of those conversations about, for example, paid family medical leave have been focused in more on the experience of parents with minor children and not as much on other types of caregiving, such as elder care. So it's an opportunity for people to really get engaged, to call you know, their members of Congress, but even to talk in their workplace about, you know, when we're thinking about a family-friendly workplace, what does that look like for people who are caring for an older adult? and not just those who are caring for kids, um, because care is something that happens all across your life. I also think there's a sense of helping people plan for caregiving needs. One of the questions that's still out there is what is the impact gonna be of people in recovery from COVID, the sort of long haulers? And I think that's gonna be something new for us to be thinking about is, is that going to become a new chronic disease if you are recovering from COVID and if so, you know, what do we need to sort of tackle that um, together and as a family? Yeah, those are some great points. Uh, and and I'm, I'm so grateful to the National Alliance for Caregiving for the advocacy work that you are all doing. And I know there's also a RAISE Council, which is really focused in on family caregiving. And they have, they've had one report come out, I believe, and another one is coming shortly or just released. Uh, and so I know that that group is is working to, um, again, bring up the topic of caregiving and how do we support caregiving. I love, I, I would imagine that it's called RAISE because you're raising up the caregiving issue, but there could be another reason for the name. Uh, but I, lo I love it. <laughs> I love that. I, I was just thinking that Josh Groban song, you raised me up. I, I don't know that they have a theme song yet, but they should think about Josh Groban as a, as a theme song. Um, it actually stands for the recognize, um, assist, include, support, and I want to say educate um, caregivers. But, but I think the idea is that how do we elevate this to national discussion. So the RAISE Council lives at the Administration for Community Living, which is a center under the Department of Health and Human Services. And they've been charged with create this report, bring it back to Congress and to the Secretary of Health and Human Services and tell us what do we need to make life better for caregivers in the US. And in doing that, they've released 26 recommendations and then after those recommendations um, are fully fleshed out into a big report, that report will come out. And that report will include not just the recommendations, but stories about real people who've been impacted by their caregiving experience. One of the things that I have to smile about is that it is not a federal report. It is not the government saying, hey, you need to do this other branches of government. It's truly a national report, much like you might see um, in the Alzheimer's space under the National, um, the, the national um, Alzheimer's Project Act, where they've got a Napa Council and they, and they create a report and they say, this is what we're gonna do as a community. So I think when we get the report fully fleshed out and it's out, 
it's an opportunity for all of us to think about how can we play a part in implementing some of these recommendations. So it's not just the government that needs to act, but companies, employers, people who are experiencing it, people who are providers. So there's a lot of opportunity there for us to work together. Wonderful. Well, well, I certainly look forward to that report and, and reading their recommendations. So thanks for giving us a little uh, foretaste of what's to come from the, the Rays Council. And I think the Josh Groban theme song is very appropriate. So please take that back. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, everyone, we're going to take some questions from the audience. We have a few that have come in already. So on Facebook, feel free to uh, list your, your question in the comments section below. And if you're on Zoom, you can pop your question into the Q&A box or the chat. Uh, but we have Connie who uh, has said, yes, we need more awareness for caregiving. Um, and um, as uh, as a caregiver, um, it's uh, it's it's a need, but it can sometimes be hard. And as the baby boomers expand, how do we get more caregivers? Uh, she says it's it, it's a hard but rewarding job. Uh, so that is a real um, issue that we're facing as a society. And as our society ages, uh, there's now more people over the age of 65 than under the age of five. And so that's going to impact the number, sheer number of people available to care for the aging population. So uh, any thoughts there, Grace, on on how we can make sure that these individuals get the support they need. And Connie, thank you for your question. Hawaii is kind of an interesting state, actually. So I, I'm, I appreciate that Connie shared she's from Hawaii because they are very activated um, in terms of caregiving. They actually have a state plan for uh, caregivers and they have a special caucus in the legislature called the Kapuna Caucus, which works on caregiving issues. And one of the things that we think could be helpful is for each state to think about what's our state plan for caregiving. And we have um, put out a paper a couple of weeks ago that provides some examples of what that looks like at our website. And you can kind of see this is how other state plans work and, and what kinds of things they might focus on. So that's a great place to start, especially as a community, because those types of um, caucuses or committees are usually pretty easy to to pull together in the sense of you know people care about this topic so many people are impacted by it so your state representatives and your state um, governors and those folks have an interest in this topic in most cases because the, the state really takes on a lot of the uh, the health care costs especially if you think about a program like a medicaid program it's usually the state that's making a lot of decisions there. And same with public health. That's really something that lives in states and communities. So I think it's a great place to start. Um, it's also interesting because Connie, in your question, how can we get more caregivers? I'm thinking about, there's sort of a divide when you ask caregivers, did you have a choice to do this? And it's a complicated question. When we look at this with AARP, it's a 50-50 split. You know, some people say, yes, I chose to do this. And if you say you chose to be a caregiver, you find that experience more rewarding. You feel like it brings more honor and purpose to your life. It gives you a chance to live your values. But if you felt like you had to go into it because there was nobody else to do it, just that feeling, even when we control for other factors, is enough to create more strain. So I also think there's this piece here about how do we help those who don't feel like caregiving is rewarding or who are exhausted? How do we help them to find the silver lining to be able to weather that experience and come out on the other side, um, maybe better or at least as good as they were before they started? Yeah, I think that's, that's such an important um, thing that you brought up, Grace, and I think it is, you know, resources, wrapping those individuals with resources that truly support them on their caregiving journey. So, so to your point that they, they come out either at baseline or with a, a skill set that they now never thought that they needed or never thought that they would um, gain from being a caregiver, uh, because you do grow and, and learn a lot in that role, but it's not always easy and people don't always choose to become a caregiver. And then I think to the professional caregiving workforce, um, there is definitely a need. We see that at Home Instead. We're always looking for um, 
people that have the heart for serving others to come work in, in the professional care setting. I think we're also going to see a growing need uh, in that arena too. And, and what can we do to uh, make that job rewarding and to create kind of a career path for caregivers? Uh, so they see that as as a true job in a career field. So I know that's something that we're passionate about at Home Instead, uh, not only empowering the family caregiver, but also how do we build up that workforce uh, to, to provide those more professional services so, so that family caregivers can get the support and the rest that they need to continue. It's gonna take both kind of that dyad to, to really help make an impact um, on, on the aging population and to others that, that need care and support regardless of their age. Absolutely. And if anyone else has a question for us, please feel free to chat uh, in the Q&A box. We would love to take your questions. Uh, and I know Grace had mentioned the National Alliance for Caregiving's website. Uh, it, it has so many great resources on there. I think I go there several times a month at the least uh, just to uh, access your Caregiving in the U.S. report. I know you mentioned um, working with your, your state legislators and and lawmakers, and, and that report has so much rich information that can help to tell the caregiving story and, and there's other great resources. So we'll make sure to put their website in the chat box as well. Um, and we, we invite you to visit the National Alliance for Caregiving's website to learn more about the important work that they're doing. Well, and if I can just put a plug, Lakeland, I, I have to say, you know, one of the things that, um, I'm excited about as I know you just got your PhD and I I was like super excited for you to be Dr. Lakeland but part of it is that data and research really drives policy and that was something that came out loud and clear during COVID-19 is particularly when it comes to um, non-white families that there was not enough data at the outset of COVID-19 to really be able to create equitable health policy because there were places where we just didn't know what we didn't know when it came to families that might be black or Asian American or Latino or Hispanic. And, and by not knowing that you can see that impact uh, over the last year where you have communities that felt excluded where you have communities where maybe the government hasn't built the trust that they need to engender. And even now in vaccine rollout, it's been fascinating to watch because at first there were several stories saying, well, there's so much mistrust of the system that you know, some communities of color won't take the vaccine. But now as the research is emerging, that's actually not true. There are many people of color um, and families that say they do want access to the vaccine, but they don't know how to get it. And so I think that that importance of research really helping us to think about how do we think about these issues and testing our assumptions is just such a key part of building a better world for families. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and, and again, I know your, your organization is, is heavy into to the research and the advocacy. So thank you again so much for all the work that you do at the Alliance. Um, and it seems like we, we don't have as many questions uh, coming in. So um, I just uh, wanna thank everyone for, for joining. Um, again, this is a monthly chat that we do, our next chat. Uh, we're gonna be uh, kind of along the same vein of this conversation. We're gonna be looking at COVID a year in review specific to dementia family caregivers, because we know that um, if you look at the research, um, individuals that, that care for a person living with dementia they often experience more stress and strain. And so um, emotional, physical uh, stress and strain as well. So uh, we'll be diving deeper into that topic with our partners at Us Against Alzheimer's. So uh, we invite you back on April 15th for our next caregiver chat. Um, but Grace, I wanna say thank you again so much for joining me today and for all the work that you do in this space. It's so, so important. I just, I'm just tickled to have gotten a chance to talk about caregiving and to spend the lunch hour with you and with our friends who are watching online or who are on Facebook. So thank you uh, for, for all that you do and for opening up this conversation. Oh, the pleasure is, is truly all, all, all mine. And I'm grateful to everyone who has joined us for today's chat. It is being recorded and we'll post it back out. So if you'd like to rewatch it or share it, uh, we invite you to do so. But until next month, we, in, 
we encourage you all to take care of yourselves uh, and uh, to be kind to one another. And we wish you all just a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. Take good care. Bye. Take